beep, 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 A Radio Step Zero broadcast. Hello, hello, replay land and lurkers and people that are getting in here eventually that can't hear me right now. Welcome to another random draw stream with your pal. Statistical L0, the L stands for Lee. Um, just get right into it, I suppose. Uh, just do a do us a you know, one of our nightly good night sketches as we sit and talk. As I mean, I, I I'm not really up on on like today's current events. Uh, from what I've seen, like Gambit wearing a crop top, it's it's huge news. <laughs> mm. You know, a uh, a random tweet came across my timeline, um, and I couldn't help but think about it. Uh, it had a lot to do, a little bit to do with with you know the the stuff that I've been trying my best to ignore, the uh, Ripper versus Ethan stuff. Now, John's long long box. You guys might know he's got he's got a channel that very very much focuses on comic books, and I love to see that. Uh, he you know he remarked on how how tiring it's getting, and how you know it'd be nice to focus on comics. And and Ethan responds, so he responds with with um. Let's see, what, I don't want a lot of action. There we go. He responds with like, you know, because it's really boring. Comic streams are really boring. Nothing more boring than a bunch of old people sitting around talking about comics that they like. Not an audience for it. Uh, you know, I wonder if that's true. I mean, I suppose it's possible if you're thinking about you're trying to make millions doing comics. That might be a true statement, but if you are looking at just, you know, having a hobby comic or whatever that, you know, you can maybe make just even a little living for yourself or a, a nice side hustle, I, st I still think there is uh, an audience for it. Um, but uh, I, I, it's kind of a sad thing to hear at any rate. Like he said, he's, he's protecting the medium that he loves comics. Um, and that is by you know calling out ripa ripa's you know doing what he does um and you know i i also saw a tweet from uh, niall scala and he talked about how he thought you know like and this is a great point and i respect more uh, niall more every every day he talked about how like you know he feels that people are shooting themselves or stabbing themselves in the foot with all this not only uh, encouraging participating in the drama just imagine where they could go if they were like on the same team and encouraging each other and helping each other through the the difficult spots um uh i agree i mean it's possible that especially with this uh comics only have maybe 20 years you know like like the main people propping this stuff up are people that uh, you know, I mean, the, the last the last guard was the people that had uh, really liked comics in the 90s. Um, and, the, you know, that the just kind of stuck around. Of course, the, the people from the 80s and 70s and things like that, 60s. Um, but, uh, you know, once once they go, you might not have you might not have enough to keep it from being anything unless there's a resurgence that can happen keep it from being anything other than a hobby situation. I, I don't believe comics will ever go anywhere. Um, I think that, that uh, you know, they'll always be around. It's just a matter of whether they're going to be, you're going to be able to make money off of them or not. It might just situate, you know, turn into a situation where it's just something that people, people 
make comics for fun. Um, you know, and if that's, that's what it is, then that's what it is. At least, at the very least, that person is getting something, you know, to do with their life, to, to you know, build a skill, to have something to focus on. Uh, and that's a good thing in and of itself. You know, just having something to improve on in your life, even if you're working a nine to five job, it's really important to have something like that so that, you know, every day isn't exactly the same and you're not just kind of running on a treadmill in life um, trying to, you know, like find some kind of meaning. You can find that in a hobby, even if, you know, you, you have to do you have to do the other thing for a while, you know, like like that's that helps, you know, whether it's music or it's comics or something like that, uh, you can you can, you know, find some meaning in that. So. When that was said, if the comics are boring, or people talking about comics are boring, um, and you know, obviously the drama is more exciting, it just got me. It, it's always sad to see, and, I, and this is probably the third or fourth time I've seen that people saying, you know, I like comics, but they're boring to talk about. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, we're not a, most of our kids anymore, so we're not going to really want to sit around and talk about characters. A lot of I like talking about characters. Um, and we're going to not necessarily talk about stories, but more the, the impact that they had on us and uh, the creators. What the creators like what they're doing, maybe their processes to get a, far enough into the weeds. Um, you know, and I was thinking a lot about, you know, that approach to. To, you know, like the different cultures where you have manga, you have uh, Euro albums over in Europe. French and Spain, more specifically, you know, everybody reads them. Um, you know, it's it's a very prestige kind of thing. They're they're nice. A lot of them are hardcover. Um, and you know, like you might grab one for yourself, and your dad might read it because it looks interesting. That's just a form of entertainment over there. Um, and manga, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a commute kind of thing for a lot of people. You know, made cheap, disposable. Um, uh, but you know you can still collect them a lot of them are magazine form you know in, in di different installments and stuff and then they of course they put the most popular stuff excuse me out in book form very it's 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 almost it's weird it's almost like the comic book cultures between the u.s you know the main ones u.s uh brazil i would actually count as well south america they got i mean although i, I feel like they they may skew manga but i mean they've got like uh, a pretty decent comic scene down there they would have to because i mean there i've seen a lot of comic book pros from around that area like the brazilian area uh south america you know maybe some panama puerto rico you know like latin types and, and i don't know if that kind of spins from that culture like or you know like i just said in like spain you know they got the a lot of spanish comics that i absolutely wish would be for spanish and french i wish they would be translated more you know, I uh, I did a um, I think I talked about this on another stream, but I did a a check. Like I went in as a completely new comic fan. Like you know, we're talking somebody that that uh, never read comics before, but really wants to try it out, right? So I went in with that mindset, um, and I started looking through like the different stuff. I went and looked through manga. I went and looked through American comics. I went and looked through Euro albums, right? And what I came up with were very three very different things on Amazon, right? If, unless I wanted French or Spanish comics. If I'm in English, you know, looking to get into comics, all right? So here's here's what I found. And this is very illuminating to me. Uh, with, with Euro comics... You know, you're, it's kind of few and far between. There is some stuff. You know, you got like the Meta Barons. You got like some, a little bit of Lucky Luke Black Sad. Um, you've got uh, uh, maybe some asterisks and obliques uh, kind of stuff. But but uh, Tintin, for the most part, um, a lot of it is, it's either way out of print or very expensive because it's like hardcover collected type stuff. Um, and and, and it's, it's spotty on how you can find it. Right, you might be able to find one of them, but not the other ones because they're out of print, or you might just not be able to find it because it's it's not translated. So it was it was that was the most difficult for me to find, you know, stuff. And and admittedly, in my collection, the Euro 
the euro section of it is the smallest although i, I do love the books that i found um the uh the american stuff you're you're seeing a lot of editions of the same thing there's a ton of stuff you know lots of it superhero lots of all kinds of stuff you're seeing a lot of editions of the same thing like you're gonna get into some batman and it's like where do i start you know there's so much of it but um a mixture again of out of print and different versions and and uh, omnibuses and treasuries and absolutes and you know all these all these different things um it's it's very overwhelming right when you're when you're looking at american comics to kind of figure out where you want to start uh, you know you have to just kind of dive in and figure it out like do i like this do i not well this is a dud this is good uh now manga manga was in my opinion as quote unquote a new guy looking around to see what there is manga was the most streamlined easiest experience for me i went and i i just looked up you know some manga and i click on one and i would see like you know it's part of this series you click on that series and they are all in print right there ready to go fairly cheap you know eight to fifteen bucks a piece or something like that i believe i looked at like uh an ultraman series i said you know just randomly like okay i i uh there was an ultraman netflix thing i wonder if they got any books of ultraman and i found that stuff oh shoot jim cox to start over welcome jim welcome uh to the nest good to see you um and uh and you know if you don't like manga the problem is it is the easiest to find it's the and i think one of the charms people talk about like storytelling in it they talk about style i think one of the biggest charms for manga is something that american comics used to have and that is long runs with the uh with the same creative team and many times in many cases in this deal it's the uh, series creator you know like so if uh you know stan and jack had just huge long runs on all the books they had going on at the time that's that's the kind of experience experience you get with uh with the manga stuff that's what Hey, J-Bot, welcome, welcome to the nest. Good to see you. Um, so between the three, American, Euro, and, and Manga, I found, although admittedly, uh, admittedly, I I, uh, I don't read a lot of manga, but I'm doing this objectively. Looking at the three, the Euro, the American, and the manga, the manga was by far the easiest to get started. They have numbered volumes. Most of, They're kept in print, a lot of them. Um it's uh it's i can see why it's so easy because it's an easy jumping on point uh jim cox says i like the manga style but i will not read a backwards book the, some books not all of them some books they will flip i mean you can find uh and it's probably more the now see with manga i find i like 80s manga 80s and early 90s you know like i like the look of akira i haven't bought it yet they do have flipped versions of that where you can read it like a normal book um uh dark horse sometimes when they put they put manga out they they reprint the stuff and they will flip it you know um and that's like I, what do they say something crazy like 80 percent of their sales or something nuts is is manga so you can find that stuff there uh when they re-release it um but uh yeah that that is the other thing of course with the reading backwards stuff um eric guapa welcome welcome this is missing out on a lot of great art and stories i i agree now see the funny thing about manga is I noticed this flipping through one, you know, people talk about how it's 120 pages for eight bucks or whatever like that. Really though, uh, from this, some of the ones that I looked at and I looked at like My Hero Academia, I looked at, I think Chainsaw Man, Kaiju number eight, uh, a couple of these newer ones, you know, I noticed that they were two to four panels per page, you know, and they or really big panels, usually three on average, I think three, eight, three panels per page. Um, and I found that, you know, like if you were to take that and put it on its side, double it, you'd get about a standard size comic, which is typically four to six page, or panels on average. Now you got to cut that page count in half. You're looking at all of a sudden like a 56 page book for eight or $9, still not bad, but it's black and white. Um, so, I mean, I think that does round out the, um, the, uh, value a little bit. You know, especially if it's black and white. Um, and sometimes th some of the stuff I've looked at, you know, you'll have two or three pages of 
of uh, talking and then like 20 pages of an action scene, you know, so it's it moves pretty fast. There's just a lot of destruction, kind of cool, cool sights and stuff like that. But when you really think about it, like reading material, um, you know, you're going to want to get the entirety of that. That 20 volume book to really get a lot but then that's only really like 10 volumes of an american situation you know like so it's it really does even out but the nice thing is like i said the big advantage they have is uh long citizen ronan welcome welcome to the nest good to see you um yeah you get a long long run with they with that that uh single creator and the thing is like they're probably usually like uh, trying different things and getting better and better throughout their run so you kind of grow with it it's like harry potter right you started out as a little kid's book and then as you got to the uh you got to the um you know like later series it got really thick because they she was growing up with her audience she was growing the stuff up with her audience um so <laughs> I might buy Akira. I don't know. I'm thinking about getting that box set. Maybe uh, Valley of the Wind, you know, Nausicaa, possibly. These nice box sets. I would like a bigger style book. I, I, I would rather... I've got All You Need Is Kill. All right? I've got that, and I've got a, a, a Dracula adaptation. And then as far as flipped reading, like, left to right, I've got Domu, which is by the guy that did Akira. I don't mind that. Pretty art. Um... But uh, I haven't looked into a ton of it. Berserk, I everyone says that's great. It's really not for me. I looked into it. That's not for me. Lone Wolf and Cub, maybe if I can find a decent collected. I would. I might look at that. Um, a lot of people really like that. But I haven't found a ton. A ton of manga that's that's just really interesting to me. Uh, and no, it's no, I know it's out there. They've got the uh, they got the variety. I just have not really located it yet. Um, which is fine. Which is fine. Uh, same with Euro stuff. Like I've, I've, I'm, there's lots of Euro stuff. I found a few things, but some of it's just not really interesting to me at all. Um, but going back to what I was kind of saying before, because because I <laughs> I started talking. Um, oh, Vinland Saga is a favorite of mine. Eric Papa says I will write that down and take a look at it. Let me just got a piece of paper around here. Stat? Huh? Oh, here we go. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay um but yeah so back before anybody actually came in here and i was i was sitting there talking to myself for the replay crowd i got to talking a little bit about just this tweet that i noticed or this reaction about john's long box saying can't we talk about comics and the good ones and the things we'd love and ethan mentioning that he thought that was boring and nobody, there's no audience for just people sitting around talking about comics that they like. I I think if you are looking for like millions of dollars, he might be right. Okay? But if you're looking to kind of build that audience around comics, not having a fishing channel and then, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I like comics. Here's one about fishing. Um, you know, because you, you probably won't get as many people that way. But, I mean, really bolstering up comics. I do think there's an audience for it. And I, th and I think that, that, you know... You got to get excited about it in order in order to um yeah i mentioned that to Amanda a while ago um eric says i really a really good manga excellent storytelling and art doesn't have to uh, have all the men looking like teenage girls yeah i agree and um you know i looked through attack on titan too that just didn't really look like it appealed to me very much uh, although it's it's incredibly popular i wouldn't knock people for liking it um, but, uh, you know, like, I, I think part of the problem is you got to really get excited. I think excitement is contagious, but a lot of people, they, they, they'll talk about their favorite books, but I don't know necessarily if the excitement's there. If, you know, like you can really feel that energy of like, this book is something special. Cause I know I watching the professionals there or Andy or Aaron, there've been quite a few times, uh, uh, um, Aaron, Andy, and uh, Graham, especially. There have been a, quite a few times where they've been talking about this book. And I have absolutely had to go on Amazon, find myself a copy of it, and order the dang thing just because of how they were talking about it. Um, and I think I think that that there, there needs to be a bit more of that. Um, I almost forgot I was working on a drawing. Um, 
in order for comics to do well because i mean you know we we really are at a situation where if you don't find more readers the old guard is just going to they're going to die away in 10 10 to 20 years i mean most of the comic faring audience most of the comic people that that are fans are, are in their 40s to 60s right now uh, eric says ethan's getting out competed on the comic end and that is what i think he's acting how he is ethan just does, didn't insult john with his comment didn't just insult john with his comment but he also insulted a bunch of his friends and a bunch of other shows that talk comics he, you know, I didn't get upset about it. I, I don't really see it as drama. That's, you know, that's his, that's his position is his uh, uh, outlook on YouTube. But I think John's getting a uh, following. And I do believe that people like Rini, people like the Diaz brothers are legitimately building an audience out of comic books. Now, Ripa, he's another one that's got, he's got like five different audiences that are, you know, that are supporting him. Comic books is one of them. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's the biggest, I'll be honest. You know, he's, he's got politics and music in there, which are both much, much bigger. And, you know, like kind of movies and things like that. A little bit of video games, I suppose. Not as much. I know he plays, you know, like Mario Kart with like the Geeks and Gamers crew and stuff like that. But uh, I do think his is a bit split just as well. Um, same with Ethan getting bigger on, uh, on um, Star Wars, you know. Um, but I do believe, I do believe that there is, so what if you're not making a million, a million, uh, views, you know, you can make a hundred thousand views on a comic book channel just by yourself. And, and maybe you're selling 10, 20% of that, you know, that's pretty darn good for one person. I still think that there is, um, there's room there and I, 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 I want to see a resurgence so badly. But I mean, of course, there's an audience because I mean, you look at you look at guys like uh, like Kenneth Roquefort, who just does draw streams. He does what he he's an artist. He does what he does, and he's he's doing very well. And uh, his his I think his campaign just passed sixty five thousand in just a couple of days. That's an audience, you know. That's that's people that love and support his work and him. And uh, that that alone is saying, you know. So he he does his draw streams, and and if if that's boring, then I, I guess I like boring stuff that uh, Billy just did a draw stream the other day. I like listening to him. They sit and they talk while they, while they, uh, you know, draw and you get to hear, you know, different perspectives, what they think on things. You get to see what they're doing. You know, like that's, that's knowledge that, that, uh, more people should pay attention to that stuff, you know, like, so hey, that way you don't have to sit and rediscover it, but but I think, yes, one place I will say Ethan may be right is if you're looking to make millions of dollars, talking comics probably isn't going to do it. There's just not enough people that are passionate. And uh, and half of those people want to be creators themselves, you know, so that's going to be a bit different. Um, the non-creators, you know, it's it's sometimes you're talking about stuff that only creators want to hear and the, uh, the fans are going to dip out a little bit. But um, but I think the excitement now manga channels, I think there are quite a few more out there and they do get a lot of interaction and they do have fans that really get into talking the stories, which for some reason in America. <laughs> if you're looking for a million dollars, art's not for you. Yeah, well, uh, obviously, unless you're like, you know, Jim Lee or something selling a piece, <laughs> X-Men piece or something. But I mean, even then, that's kind of just art collectors. Um, but, you know. America just a large chunk of the fans it's either like like zero or a hundred when it comes to talking about the books you're either not really talking about the books and you're talking about the creators or you're talking so hard about the books that you know people kind of wonder maybe if your your touch of reality isn't quite a little a little off kilter you know like when you're when you're screaming at somebody like because something bruce did in some some part of a comic and he didn't do it in the movie and they they don't know that but you do and you know like but um i uh i i i believe that there is a way forward with comics i think that that um like niall scala had said you know if 
if you had people instead of fighting each other, kind of guiding each other through different problems and propping each other up, of course, that would take a bit of a, a, a reduction in ego and to be able to be mature enough to be able to say, look, my idea is not as popular as that guy's idea over there. And to be able to, you know, like, like be mature in that and say like, hey, I've still got an audience. It's not as big as that guy's audience, but it's an audience nevertheless. You know, you've got to be able to have that, which I think there's a critical, uh, and this is not, this is everybody. This is, I, you know, you've seen it with the industry pros for years, that, um, decades even, uh, you, you have to be able to have a humility, you know, uh, and, and there's not a lot of that around. Um, but, you know, there is an audience. There are there are people that are doing well. I mean, like uh, Blood Realm right now, like uh, he's at one day, I think it's he, Rob Geronimo is almost at five thousand dollars. That's a that's a nice little audience. I mean, yes. He's going to need 10 to get his thing done, but I believe he will. This is this is issues, what, 14 through 18, 15, what is it? Let me check quick. 15 through 18, right? Uh, that's a heck of a, a feat, I think. 18 issues, 20, 20 pages a pop. That's a great job. You know, that's... Um, but uh, I... I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you, you got to ask yourself a little bit like, what the heck are we doing here then if comics are so friggin' boring? I don't believe that's the case. I I think they are exciting. You know, when you when you get into a really good comic, um, you know, there's a feeling there. Sister Rona says, the question you uh, is, are you here for comics, art, or here for YouTube? If you're here for YouTube, just walk away from comics and stop the BS. I mean, I think there's room for both. I just think the thing is, YouTube gets more uh, attention because it's more immediate. Um, and, and, you know, nobody's really cracked the code yet as far as comic books go. But, but I am happy to see, you know, there are a lot of producers here. Like, you know, you've got, like, the Zaid, uh, the BS brothers, they, um... How many properties do they have now because of the lost pages which was i is exactly what i would have done when launching something new um you know do like a anthology get four or five properties off the uh off the ground figure out which ones are the the most popular and then run with it oh man being a youtube quote-unquote personality i agree that's ridiculous i think youtube should be used for uh, connecting with your audience um I think having seven hour streams where you just make fun of people and look at videos is almost counterproductive. It's counterintuitive. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it helps prop comics up. If anything, it puts them on the back burner um, and, you know, makes them absolutely secondary, which is what the, the studios did to comics in the first place. So I, I would think if you're, if you're fighting to protect your medium and, and the, the art form that you love, you would put that at the forefront is is my is my uh my thing and there are plenty that are still doing that um they they might not be making as much as some of these bigger youtube personalities but you know they're still making a decent amount and i'm proud of them for that um but uh you know i i i have to admit you know to you guys here i have to admit I was looking back at my uh, my my YouTube, not my YouTube time, my uh, Twitter timeline, my X timeline, and I couldn't help but notice that I personally, right, not all, I was pointing things out that I was seeing. A lot of it was not good. It was negative. And I think that's, that is, sometimes you got to admit, like, maybe you're walking down a wrong path. Uh, and I believe I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm having to turn around and, and get some directions and, and move forward again. But, but I, I, I do believe I need to be counting or pointing out more the, the good stuff, you know, because I mean, once you start pointing out the bad stuff, even if it's true, you know, that's, that's just kind of what you, uh, what you focus on and you don't really see the good stuff or if you see the good stuff, it's in the background. And I think what people need now is the equivalent of a uh, a um, 
you know, a feel good movie. You know, what, what's a good, uh, um, I'm trying to think of his name. One of my favorite directors. Uh, Frank Capra. Yes, that's the one. Frank Capra. I'm a huge Frank Capra fan. And the funny thing about his stuff is it, it, a lot of times his movies came out in really hard financial times and they did very, very well because people were getting beat up by life and they needed something good to focus on. You know, like uh, you can't take it with you or Mr. Deeds goes to town or or uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know, um, and they always did financially well. The critics always dismissed as, dismissed them as uh as uh you know idealism crap garbage you know they wanted they wanted more gritty stuff uh and the gritty stuff at the time didn't do as well in the theater because it was just garbage outside now uh once things started to improve his movies started to to not do as well because people were moving on to now that times were better they could watch you know garbage i mean like garbage i say like you know violent movies and things like that versus the really feel good happy movies that uh, capra was putting out you know and, and i believe that embittered him a little bit he said hollywood he was right hollywood gave gave over to sin and it gave gave over to like really terrible stuff uh, nobody wanted to see idealism anymore um citizen ronan says i would stop following or mute people that you don't like uh are positive and productive and don't comment on the garbage okay so you are right about about not commenting i think that making a, a switch to maybe a more positive and a bit more professional uh thing is a plus right that you know people people need to be encouraged i agree with that that's what i want to try to do now the problem of muting people uh, i have muted a few people right the problem is when we are in this group, uh, a small corner of comics, you know, that's a little bit isolated, if I do say so. When one person comments on it and a bunch of people say comment on that comment, that kind of thing will still show up in X because it's either popular in your area or you're following that person. And you start to see like, you know, the random, the random responses and things. And you're like, what the heck's going on? You know, so to 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 mute like everybody would almost be ridiculous <laughs> and i can ignore most of it you know somebody had commented on one of my things if you're not involved don't get involved if you think you're involved you're not not involved you know don't get involved and uh you know i i really i don't get involved because i'm, I'm very busy with my life my comic strip stuff like that but it's just when you open it up and you notice all this stuff and it's how it's it's comics are so far onto the back burner i think it's idea it's arguing about the idea of comics system rona says he prefers idealism it's, it's arguing about the idea of comics not so much comics themselves right you know uh or the control over over you know said comics and stuff nobody may want to talk about an old issue of the specter and you know people can say oh yeah that character was kind of cool they don't want to dissect art. They don't want to talk about story. Except for, you know, you do actually have a small group of producers. People that really produce. Analyzing and, and cutting this stuff apart. Um, sometimes it brings a lot of drama. Like that, uh, what's his name? Tyler? Guy that does, uh, uh, I think it's like some kind of, it looks like manga, but it's not manga. You know, he, the dude, when he says something, he, he makes himself an observation. He tends to kick up a lot of fights. Some people call it, you know, say that he's doing it on purpose to generate more, um, more eyeballs. I don't know. I have no idea. I see him on my, my uh, timeline every once in a while. But you do have people like the guys over on Creative Block. Narwhal, I saw a picture of his, his uh, comic table over at a convention and, uh, that dude has a colossal eagle it, you know i i don't know a lot about him but it it does sound like he's he's giving out a lot more advice than than i think maybe he has experience i don't know that's just an outside look right that's um that's uh from a uh, out looking out the window situation i don't know enough about him i know he follows me and I, I follow him back i believe um some of the stuff he says that I, I i can agree with other stuff maybe not so much but i guess that's just the human condition 
Um, I try to be diplomatic, not to start stuff. But uh, well, yeah, you got you got people like uh, like you know. I saw Narwhal a picture of his uh, his booth table, and that guy's got like eight or nine. Maybe 10. I can't remember how many it was. Thick books that he did. Um, and that's good work. I mean, he, he's really producing a lot of comics for people to read. And that's entertainment. And that's what comics are supposed to be about, right? Uh, so, I mean, that with him, I know he's read a lot of books about writing. A lot of books about, you know, like making stuff. Um but hey old dirty fatty welcome to the uh welcome to the nest uh, who has an ego i'm playing games with my kiddo and i missed it oh um i don't remember his name i think it's like tyler um he does um well that's what citizen rona said he has the ego i personally don't oh he's what you'd call a chitster i can see that i suppose i uh i see him on my uh, oh draw and talk the draw and talk Tyler Seward, uh, the girl with the me mega fists. That's what he does. He does that. <laughs> yeah, I said it. <laughs> this is real. But um, I I know that book's not for me, so I don't really look in a lot to what he what he's doing. He's got that, and he's got some plumber girls thing, and some like sexy high school witch high school or something like that. He's doing a lot of books. I'll give him credit. He does a lot of books. Uh, mostly it's it's manga looking stuff. That he he likes doing, I noticed. So it's it's really it's not so much for me. Um, but you got a couple of John's long box uh, here. Yep, that's uh, we that's what we were talking about. That's what started on this. Him him talking about like he says, um, this is what got kind of got me on this wavelength. Yeah, he said like, can't we just talk about the comics that we absolutely love? And then Ethan Van Skyver, he was talking to, said, no, that's really boring. There's no market for it. Um, so, but he's, he's, he's fighting with Rippa because he thinks Rippa is kind of just, uh, moving in on it for no reason. And, uh, and, um, you know, you'll thank him later for getting him out of there. And <laughs> John responded with, made me laugh. I ate at a restaurant. I didn't like the other day. You want to talk about that too? <laughs> but, um, I, I get what he's saying. And like, I, I get a little bit of both. I think like Ethan's kind of right you're talking about comics it's not a huge audience if you want to make millions of dollars comics is not a great place to be jbot says cheap manga looking stuff yeah i said it <laughs> um but uh but you know if, if i think something that comics does provide like is is very you know passionate people that can and sometimes the passionate part can turn into fights because, you know, you're defending your position so, so hard. That's part of, I guess that's just part of being a fan. You don't have a, enough people, I think, on the internet that have, have kind of honed that skill of being able to let stuff go sometimes. That's where the problem comes in. But, uh, but you know, hey, passion is a good thing in a, in a fan. It's just when they get into really disrespectful territory and have no idea how to shut the spigot off that can be a problem and i think that partly has to do with dealing with text and it has partly to do with being 500 miles away and not being able, you know not worrying about getting punched in the face when you say something absolutely out of line uh and f and cicerone's right fighting on the internet is just dumb it rarely turns changes anybody's mind if you can sometimes if you can keep really calm and just address the things that they're saying one by one i have had times when I have like de-escalated and, and sort of fixed problems, you've just got to keep your head. You can't call names. You can't say you're acting like you can't uh, assume and say, oh, you're probably just those are things that you don't want to do on the Internet. You just don't want to do it. You don't want to go in there saying I'm going to own this person, you know, just for the that's or you can just block. Them, you know, but I mean, if you're actually going to have a debate discourse, you cannot do those things. You can't say i assume that you do this but oh you probably do this oh you're just uh this you can't do that you can't uh, otherwise what's going to happen is they're going to just think about that one thing you said that's going to play over in their heads over and over again and you're done you know it's just going to be about proving you wrong making you look like an idiot because they felt like an idiot based on what you said and it turns into a revenge <laughs> And it becomes a cycle, you know, like I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it and everybody 
just all parties waste their time. And I've said it before, time is too friggin' short to be fighting on the internet. It's too short to be uh, talking about all this stuff that you don't want to talk about, you know, like, like talking about how much a movie or a show or sucks like X-Men 97 right now is the topic of debate, whether or not it sucks or not. You can say it's not for me and move on, or you can dissect it for uh, content for your channel. You know, um, not that there's much wrong, but I mean, you know, you, you got to drill for content where you can, but I've never been one of those guys that, that really needs to talk about whether or not Gambit wearing a crop top is, is accurate to the time and the character. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so, I mean, but there's been a lot of that going on. I will say that the clips I saw finally Cyclops looks good. I've been a Cyclops fan. Because of specifically, I mean, I like the cartoon, but Marvel versus Capcom, one of two, Cyclops was always my main character. I liked him. And uh, I saw the potential for Rudy. I always saw him as like a Hannibal, uh, you know, from A-Team or like a, a Batman in, in the strategist type way. Captain America is another one. Like he's three steps ahead. He's a good fighter and he can do the really cool trick shots with his, with his beam and stuff like that. Like, like some, like John Wick with, with, with push vision, basically. It's how I always saw Cyclops. So I was really glad to see that they had at least a few sequences where he got to kind of do that, you know, slide around, pushing himself around and, and hitting people, basically punching them in the face with his vision. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm not interested in the, the show. I'm not, I, I don't really feel a need to watch it. Uh, so I'm happy to let other people enjoy it. There've been a lot of people saying I watched two episodes and they look great. Sometimes they do that where they, they show you the first really good ones to um, rope you in and then they, they put the, their messages in there. You know, they do it with with uh, with HBO, you know, like like a lot of people like sex scenes and nudity. Well, you ever notice how the first one, two, maybe three seasons have a lot of that and then it just kind of disappears. Look at Game of Thrones after season five, I heard it was four or five when they ran out of book stuff. A lot of the sex stuff just kind of went away. It was gone. They didn't need it. Um, but the first couple seasons, there's a bunch of it. <laughs> hey, Phil, say comments. Welcome, welcome to the nest. Um, but I, I, I think that there is a. I still think that there is a audience for comics, for dissecting them, for talking about them, for stories, for you know, not just creators. I think that there is still a lot of that out there. Um, it's it's all a matter of getting people charged getting them fired up and ready to go you know like and the problem is the biggest problem i think that we have with uh with crowdfunding here is keeping those people charged for a year maybe a year and a half if you're on time right keeping that enthusiasm up that is hard but i think that that there is a way to expand your audience you got to take it in different places. You got to, you know, it's got to be a little painful to grow. But, uh, but it's there. Of course it's there. I, I, comics, I still see kids. I mean, yes, it is dog man. Yes, it is. It is last kids on earth or whatever. It's, but I, or manga, I see kids getting pushed around. When I go to the store, I see kids getting pushed around by the parents and carts. So these kids are like eight, nine years old. They are clutching, uh, you know, like, like, Dogman or My Hero Academia or if their parents let them read it like Chainsaw Man or something like that. They're clutching that and they are devouring it in the cart. They can't even wait to get to checkout before they start reading it. You know, it's around. It exists. It's just a matter of getting them excited about your stuff, which is the hard thing. Right. And so now some people are working with that handicap, that difficulty. I wouldn't say handicap, but difficulty of working with the derivative. All right. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, making a character that's inspired on your favorite character. You look at like Batman uh, being more like the shadow or Zorro, you know, even in the origin, he was inspired by going to Zorro and stuff like that's in some ways a little bit of a derivative uh, or the phantom. I guess you could say he's kind of close to the phantom too, the ghost who walks and like, you know, this, this giant bat creature running around in the city, a lot of similar tropes. Um, so I love me some pulp heroes. I can talk about pulp heroes all the time. Um, and uh, I wish they would come back. I'd love to see more of it. You know, the, the, the shadow type stuff, 
heck, I'd love to see the shadow again. I loved it. DC started really bringing back guys like, uh, like Dr. Dr. Fate and, uh, the question and our man and, you know, the justice society, those guys, uh, Sandman, Sandman, you know, mystery theater type stuff. I'd love to see all that make come back. Not really right now, but you know, unless of course they're going to pitch it for a uh, Netflix series, which all of those would make a great Netflix series. Just saying, but, uh, I'm more concerned with the comics. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I, I lost my train. I was on just this crazy spiral and then I lost my train of thought. Oh, anyways. Yeah. It, those people, um, they are working with a little bit of a handicap if they are working on a derivative. Right. Uh, and then of course there's the opposite side of that, sp that spectrum. If it's too far out, if it's too different, people don't want to touch it because they don't have an anchor point. So <laughs> as a creative, as a creative, you're really like between a rock and a hard place sometimes because things are moving so fast. People could be in love with your stuff one minute. They see something else like a shiny object in the dif distance. and They totally forget what you're looking at and they run off to that shiny object. Thus is the internet and how fast things move. You know, like you, you look at the trends on X, uh, you know, like one hour, you've got all this, all this stuff going on. The next hour, it's pretty much all wiped away and there's something totally new, you know, rarely. The only time I think I've seen all, um, facets of the trending on x um taken up for the entire day was when dragon ball z creator died that was really powerful you know like I, that wasn't just manga fans either that was like like um you know people that watch the cartoon the toonami fans cartoon network uh video games playing um you know budokai tension or uh, uh, dragon ball z budokai um that that's that's a lot of different corners right there of of fandom coming together not that, that's why it took the entire day it was amazing you won't see too many more people like that he is i think maybe one of the final expansive type creators that got into dang near everything we'll see for a while i believe that guy was going since what the 80s and he got into like everything so it's almost like you know, Bill Watterson was the last of the great comic strip people, you know, he was the final one. You wouldn't, you don't see any, you can, there are still some really good ones, but he was the last household name, um, that came along. And, um, and I do believe that this, what is it? Um, Akira Toriyama. Is that who that was? Uh, yes, yes, that was him. I think he's one of the last, like, like, uh, household, almost household name manga artists out there. That's, I mean, that's really produced a lot of different stuff in video games. Um, in, you know, then the dragon quest series too, you know, people know him from that. Um, Ronan says the most successful creative people can read the room and pivot when they need to. Yeah. And I mean, also adapt to different technologies too. If everybody's going digital, they know to at least have that in their back pocket. Uh, you know, so in case they have to go digital, not necessarily need to mind you, but, um, but you know, I, I've said it before. I'm a big fan of, of, uh, looking at what everybody's doing and running the opposite direction, you know? So if you're, if you're, if people are all doing superhero, I would probably look at maybe doing, you know, sci-fi or, or, uh, action, you know, adventure. And if everybody's doing that, I would probably run the opposite way like what I'm doing now. I mean, I, I specialize in comic strips. Mm, very few people are doing comic strips right now. Um, and if they do, it's it's like... I know Dillard tried to do that with the Buckler. Um, Dillard tried to do that with the Buckler. And he got about like five or six. And he realized it just wasn't worth the effort. Comic strips are a long game, right? You got it. I mean, the nice thing is, you know, if as you're putting them out every day or every week or whatever, after a certain period of time, you've got, you've got a book. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you've got, uh, you, the pressure is only on you for like a page or two pages at a time for your week or two weeks or whatever, or daily, whatever you're doing, if you got enough lead time. But once that's done and it's out, 
it, and you know, it's, you get a fan base. They want that physical. You collect it. You've got a book all ready to go in your archive. That's a, that's the magic of comic strips, and they can do so much. I was looking at. I'll probably want to bring some visuals up eventually, but I was looking at um, Graham Nolan's Sunshine State here. He's got it on Amazon for uh, you know, like a what would you say, like a um. Let me just grab an incognito tab here so I can. I can just go in without being registered. You know what I'm saying? Um, let's see. Learn my lesson. Now, see, the thing is, I've heard, I've heard by uh, by a couple of different people though that uh, you know the Sunshine State from Graham Nolan. It's not all that funny. Now, I wanna I wanna defend it a little bit. So, because I'm coming from the point of a. Uh, of a comic strip guy myself. Okay. So now. Old Dirty Fat is contrarianism. is an effective investment strategy. I also think that way. Oh, cool. All right. So now the Sunshine State here. Oh, this is, it's 78 pages, but it's like 160 or 170, uh, 170 strips. Now what the goal is, I think if I were to explain comic strips to people and, and you know how they work, you know, you, you can get into the structure of like, you know, the, the two panel setup or the one panel setup, um, you know, gag and then the takedown, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways to explain this, but I mean, looking at, at comic strips like this, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing you do, the goal is to create moments. Moments that add up that the, you know to this to a a bigger a bigger thing. So you know you've got these two friends here that are uh, they are uh, obviously like one should be the other one's food, but they're pals. They give each other crap. They break each other's balls. Uh, one loves technology. The other one's much simpler. Um, so you know you get that out of the way, and then you just throw them in different situations. He's trying to teach him all about computers and stuff and he just he doesn't have time for it he wants to go sit on the beach and have a beer um you know there's there's your standard kind of lap uh slapstick stuff down here uh right but then you know they <laughs> it's not going to be in this preview <laughs> but um there was a point where there's this little lizard lady and she's got a crush on the uh she's got a crush on the crocodile right mel and uh, she leans over and she gives him, he's sleeping, and she gives him a kiss on his head, but it's done with the shadow. You know, it's, a, it's like a sweet moment. See, if you're doing a gag strip sometimes, uh, and, and if you, you read uh, Calvin and Hobbes, if you go and read Calvin and Hobbes, you're going to see what I'm talking about when you're really looking for it. It'll be like ants on a carpet. You notice one, and then you notice all of them. Sometimes Bill Watterson and many other people, they would have uh, like an idea that they wanted to spend a week or two on. Right. Like, say, Calvin uh, gets a propeller hat and he's imagining he's sending away for it for like a serial thing. And he's and he gets all of uh, he gets all excited about how he's going to put it on his head and fly over the, the, you know, the state and all this stuff. And he gets it. And, he, and you know, he realizes it's just a dumb hat and it doesn't work. What a rip off. All right. So this took like a week, maybe two weeks. I can't remember how much time uh, Watterson spent on it. But every once in a while, you're going to have these these strips that only last like one or two. It's just a little sub observation, a little some gag. It might even be Calvin just standing there looking at something and going, huh, you know, like he's just observing something. It's not funny. It's not particularly um, uh, insightful. But sometimes what they'll do is they'll put, you know, and, and I've done this myself, you'll put a uh, just a really quick gag down that doesn't mean anything. This is like a placeholder. It's like to try to like line everything up to uh, so the other ones work uh, a little better. But not only does it do that, see, what it does is it adds a little something to the personality of the character because they can't always be hilarious moments. Sometimes you have to have sad moments, quiet moments, happy moments in a comic strip. Great thing about a comic strip daily is you can use dang near every idea that you have. But, uh, you know, they won't all be bangers. You're, they're throwing so many ideas at the reader. Old Dirty Fatty says, don't forget Walt Kelly. Of course not. Um, but you're throwing so many ideas at the reader. Not all of them are going to land. So you don't want to make them all funny. You want to make some of them just kind of like a, huh, 
or well, that's a good observation or maybe make them a little heartbreaking you know like you establish a character and you you get to know this character and then something bad happens to the character and another another character is reacting to it there have been you know like calvin and hobbes things for christmas where calvin just sits and tells hobbes how important he is to him you know like how the world would suck without him basically not funny at all it's a character moment and uh you know that wouldn't mean as much if you hadn't been through all those other little moments of you know hobbs trying to tackle calvin and them being together when they're throwing snowballs at at you know Susie and and uh making you know the the no girls allowed club but graham does that in in these pages he makes these moments between these two guys um friendship i mean that's at the core of this this book and again i'm one of these days i'm gonna get my phone out and i'm gonna i'm gonna walk through the book with you and show you some specific examples the core of this book is just about a couple of guys that are friends that really shouldn't be friends and uh some of it is i found very funny and some of it is just kind of like a, yeah, I can agree with that. I can kind of identify with that. Some of it doesn't land, I'll be honest. And it might be a situation where it's just not something that I've encountered in my life that I can identify with. That's going to happen too. I mean, uh, I didn't think anybody, you know, there was anybody that didn't like Calvin and Hobbes, but I remember seeing a couple comments like, I freaking hate Walt Simonson's, and this is in quotes, Midwestern sensibilities. So whoever this was is probably a coastal type person, maybe a southern person. Uh, just didn't like <clears throat> the Midwest humor, you know. So I get it. So you don't live in the Midwest. Don't identify with anything like that. Not going to think it's funny at all because it's got nothing to do with you or your culture, you know. I 100% get that. But I would defend, I would defend Graham's writing. And uh, like this one here, you know, you got like, you got Mel here sitting here and he flicks uh, a peanut and it, it hits, you know, was it Dink? I'm trying to remember. I know I've read, I've spent a lot of time with these guys, but I'm, uh, I'm drawing a blank. I think it's Dink. Um, but, you know, he hits it and then he says, he scores and he's, I hate football season. I, <laughs> I hate football season. You know, it's, he's, he's just, it's some good natured ribbing you know there's some some like marvel references and stuff he does some bane stuff uh <laughs> sits to, he, he gets made of like metal and stuff he gets on this is the scales way off little gags like that it says rona says they probably don't like pop indeed that's right it's like a soda right coke and like georgia everything's like coke can i get a orange coke can i get a sprite coke <laughs> um but yeah so i mean i with this with this particular series one thing that graham does and, and graham is one of the if not the last one of the last comic strip men certainly i think the only at the at right now practicing comic strip man and i haven't started yet i mean i've done what like 100 or 200 for you guys just like as as uh one-offs and stuff nothing truly official like the stuff i'm doing now it's got like uh unified lettering and and you know it's totally inked and everything like that um but as far as like like graham's been doing sunshine state a long long time so he is the only that i know of and i know gary martin had some but he hasn't it's kind of like mine it's he's building it up and he's uh he's uh he's gonna put it out maybe i would hope but uh graham he understands it and it might not be for everybody. And see, Citizen Rona says, on this topic, we'll agree to disagree. That's okay. That's fine. It's not for everybody. But I'm just telling you what I see in it. Somebody that's that you know reads a lot of comic strips and not just like for enjoyment, but looking at structure and looking at intent and looking at uh, consistency and looking at, uh, you know, not just consistency of art, but character and stuff. I think Graham, you know, he's it's it's a competent strip it's a well done strip it's sometimes uh very textbook a strip you know i mean like like um but i i like it i i will defend it um and i know it's excuse me i know it's not going to be for everybody for some people for some people um it's going to be i suppose two by the numbers 
I guess that would be the situation. It's going to be a little bit too by the numbers. Uh, and uh, I guess a little bit like a, a kind of humor you might find in, in an older older TV show or something like that. But I think that's part of the charm. Um, safe, maybe, could be the word. Safe, too family friendly, not quite... Uh, I mean, I can kind of see that stuff. But, oh, there's some strips involving this character right here that, that I really get a kick out of. Um, but so, yeah, that, that's that's me that's me defending and saying that I do. I am a fan of, of Graham's Sunshine State book. And his, and his, and his book is is for print-on-demand and stuff. It's, it's a great-looking book. So I would recommend it. But uh, that doesn't mean you have to take that recommendation. You know, that, that's just me being excited, being a comic book fan. And uh, <laughs> sharing what I'm reading, um, but I can't I can't wait for you guys to to see all the things that I've been working on in uh, in my book. Which pages are these? Um, oh, I can't show those pages right now. I can, I've shown pieces and bits. Uh, I've shown pieces and bits of uh, what I'm working on, but right now I'm in a situation where a story is coming to a head because I'm what I'm working on, it's like 60%, 70% story strip, like, and 30% gag strip. So I'm, the goal is, oh, Citizen Runner says, I think your stuff's better. I said, I thank you very much. Although Graham is 10 times the artist I am. I appreciate that. He's saying that made my whole night. Thank you. Um, yeah, but what the, the goal I'm trying to do with this is, is so, you know, it's, it, the hard thing about writing a strip like this is um, <laughs> Jim Cox is what doesn't Citizen Ronan agree with? I miss it. We were talking about uh, Graham Nolan's Sunshine State strip. He doesn't really think it's all that funny. And I actually really like it. You know, some of it not so funny, but I get the moments that he's creating. I get the, uh, the dramatic parts, the funny parts. I understand what Graham's doing with it. And I prove I like it. I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, with mine, the challenge is to be able to try my best to make every strip semi standalone or kind of standalone, but to string them all together into kind of a story that you can follow every single day, you know, going from just like little idea to little idea, having those transition strips like I was talking about. I'm on, I think, strip 34, strip 34 or 35, I think, see, I'm working on page 17. 7 and 7 is 14, 24, 24, yeah, 34. And I've written up to like 42 or something like that, I think. Uh, it's, it's taken so much longer than I thought, with, you know, having a dog and, and, and full-time job and stuff like that. You used to be able to crank these out faster, but I am a better artist than I was. Uh, <laughs> Graham is an old people like me. Well, I guess I must be old too because I get what he's doing. I, I like it. Um, but uh, I, let me just... I'll, I'll bring up. All right. So there's a quick look at what I've got so far. All right. I'm doing these in pages. So if this were an actual comic book, I'd be 17 pages in. Um, and I'm still working on it. I don't think I can actually. I don't think I can actually launch it until I get at least 50 to 100 pages in. Because, you know, 50 days, I mean, like, like if I get 100, 100 strips, that's only a little over three months. And for a daily strip artist, that's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Heck, Graham here, he's got 141 pages. He's got three pages or three strips a page. It's only 60, it's, uh, 78 pages. And uh, it's not a super thick book. But just in terms of, of daily stuff, it's going to take a lot of work. But I'm really excited because I think this is probably some of the best cartooning that I've ever done. Some of the best comic strips I've ever done. Hopefully, people laugh at the jokes. There's some slapstick stuff in there. There's some <clears throat> some real real contorted expressions and things like that. And and uh, kind of left a little bit left field humor. Not too left field. I'm not going with that super non sequitur where like it's like, you're just sitting there and then a cow hits you or something like that. Uh, you know, like, I don't, I've never read the books, but like uh, Doug Tenable's Earthworm Jim. I played the game, so it's just like, you know, I don't know where you got to pick up this 
this pig and throw him on this catapult thing and then you have to hit this uh this switch and it's like launch the pig you know and it just comes out of nowhere uh that kind of thing was really really popular Hopefully no mid midwestern sensibilities. Well, I'll try. I'll try not to, but I, they might creep in there. Who knows? Now there's there's going to be. I mean, I've got I've got the first couple of things I can I can tell you kind of what what's going on. Like like stats lost his job. He's uh, he's looking for another job. He meets this really friggin' annoying guy that he can't get rid of. He tries being an inventor. He creates this AI model thing that turns against him. Um, and, uh, and, and he, you know, he tries to start a company with a bunch of stuffed animals and they vote him out, <laughs> you know, off the board. Um, and, and the really annoying guy, people just don't want anything to do with him, keep him away from him. And there is a reason for that. He can't remember who he is. Uh, and he's just so friggin' annoying. Um, and he, you know, a lot of these guys, I'm setting the stage, they'll be re recurring characters. They'll come back over and over again slightly different they'll all have a history you know like as it builds with the with the strip so it'll be more and more fun to see them come back every time you know they'll be a bit different every time you see them um and i'm just i'm these first you know hundred strips that's really setting these people up and giving them a reason to interact with each other He's got a rooster next door to him that that crows and wakes him up every morning and he's also the the postman he delivers the mail. Uh, they don't like each other, they're neighbors. They're not huge fans of each other. They're kind of foils. You know, they're they're respectable towards each other, but it's it's they're not above quibbling about, you know, your branch is hanging in my yard kind of crap. <laughs> um, Jim Cox says I went to high school in the Midwest but not the almost Canada Midwest like Sat Stato tell me about it. Um so I think it's about an hour. I might just let, let you guys, you know, get yourselves to bed or whatever you're going to do. Let's take down some posters here. Take down that and that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I've been doing all day long for the last today. And yesterday, I've been able to spend a little more time drawing. My, my dog's been, you know, kind enough to leave me alone a little bit more and sleep. We go out on walks and play, you know, fetch and stuff like that still. But um, it has been, you know, stick my my X on notification mode so I don't miss anything from people interacting with me and then not looking at the timeline because it's been very chaotic. So the more that happens, the more I get into drawing my strips so that I can get those out as fast as I can for people. But it might just take next year to get that 150, maybe January next year. I don't know. Maybe maybe I can get it in the fall. I'm shooting for September, or October, but. <clears throat> It might be January. Who knows? That's realistically <clears throat> what I'm looking at. Um, but anyways, guys, thank you very much for uh, hanging out uh, to the people that are here, the people that were here or that are lurking or that are on replay. Uh, always gra great to have you here. Means the world. Uh, have a great rest of your night or day, whatever you read this. Uh, and God bless. <laughs>